All right, section 0 0.4 is inverse functions. Specifically, we're going to talk about some inverse trigonometric functions as well. So for inverse functions, one of the things we need to note is that they have to satisfy two conditions. And the first one is that uh, g of f of x is equal to x for every x in the domain, and that um, in terms of y, f of g of y is equal to y for every y in the domain of g. Um, and if those things are true, then for any function, I should be able to say that those are inverses. So whatever I plugged in here, in this case, x, I should get that as my output if I plug it into f of x and then plug that value into g of x. The computations in 1 show that g of y is equal to the cube root of the quantity y minus 1. This is the inverse of f of x is equal to x cubed plus 1. Thus, we can say g is an inverse notation as. Keep in mind that we are saying here that f is not f to the negative 1, but the inverse of f. So, let's see. Example number 2, the inverse of f of x equals 2x is 1 half x, and that the inverse of f of x is equal to x cubed. Um, the inverse here, x is uh, f of x is equal to x to the one-third. Let's show that. What's up, Mr. Burkett? We start by switching the x and the y, and now we're going to solve for y, keeping in mind that this y right here is really the inverse. So one-half x is equal to the inverse. All right, so we confirm that the first one is true. So let's take a look at the second one and start by writing the original function. I like to switch the x and the y right off the bat. So again, remember this is our inverse. And so in order to solve for that, we're going to take the cube root of x is equal to the inverse. and Using our remembering of laws of exponents, this is x to the one-third, so check on both. Given that the function f has an inverse, and that f of 3 is equal to 5, find the inverse of 5. The important thing to note here is that when you have an inverse, the domain and the range flip-flop. So what used to be x, in this case, is going to become the output. So this point would have the reverse or flipped. So this is now my input, which was my output. So this is going to be my new output. It's going to be 3. All right, so in order to find the inverse, what we want to make sure we do is write down the equation, solve the equation, and then we're going to switch the x and the y. We're going to do what I just did on the last two slides, which I'm guessing I was supposed to confirm, so I was supposed to plug in x. So, hey, way to go, Collins. Let's rewind. So what I should have done was plug this in here and prove that I actually get x out. So x is my input. So plug in 1 half x into 2x, and I get x. And I should do the same thing here. That's awesome. And I end up with x. And yes, confirmed, those are both inverses. All right, so um, this is a recap, because I'm a silly bear. Uh, the resulting equation, so when you're done, you should have solved for the new y, the quote unquote new y, which remember is your inverse. OK? Um, and if that's true, then you can say that yes, indeed, they're inverses. So let's do a couple. Find the formula for the inverse f of x is equal to the square root of 3x minus 2, and x is the independent variable. State the domain of the inverse. Okay, so what I'm going to do to start, um, I'm going to walk you through this one. What I'm going to do to start is I'm actually going to figure out what my domain and range are to begin with. So it's a square root. So I know that my range is going to be 
y is greater than or equal to 0. There's no shift on the outside. And now I'm going to look at the inside and recognize that this has to be true. And if that's true, then x has to be greater than or equal to 2 thirds. What should happen is my inverse should flip those. My input should be greater than or equal to 0, and my output should be greater than or equal to 2 thirds. So now I'm going to solve and find the inverse. And what I want to do is switch the x and the y. and solve for the new y. Remember, the new y is my inverse. So I get a new inverse of And now the values that I can plug in here are going to be greater than or equal to 0. And the range is going to be greater than or equal to 2 thirds. No matter what. OK. So, a function has an inverse if and only if it's one to one. That is the horizontal test. So, the horizontal line test. So, the vertical line test is used to figure out if a, an equation is a function, and the horizontal line test is used to determine if it's one to one. One to one means that this y value can only be used once. It cannot be used twice. Example 5, use the horizontal line test to show that f of x equals x squared has no inverse, but that f of x equals x cubed does. So the horizontal line test says that I'm going to show that any number cannot be used more than once, any y value, that is. So. I'm going to show that by graphing a parabola, parabola for Mr. Clinton's kids. And so this is my y equals x squared. And you can see clearly that we have an issue because it fails the horizontal line test. When it comes to x cubed, something like this. And you can see that no matter where I draw a horizontal line, Yay, it passes, and we are happy campers. Explain why the function f that is graphed in this figure has an inverse, and find the inverse at 3. OK, why does it have an inverse? What do you see? It passes the horizontal line test. I will use the HLT notation because I'm lazy. The horizontal line test. OK, and now I want to find the inverse um, at 3. Well, the inverse at 3 can be found by looking at what the output was when f was 3, or scratch that. Where is f of x equal to 3? So we're looking at the y value. So I want a y value of 3. So I'm going to come over to my graph. I see that y equals 3 here, and it hits right here. What x value made that happen? 2. So the inverse, 2. So this, coming from the original equation, has an ordered pair of 2 comma 3. Remember, what was the input? becomes the output. All right, an inverse of the graphs. Inverses of graphs, when you look at them, you can tell if they're inverses if they are reflected over the y equals x line. Again, you can check that graphically and numerically. We found these on one of the earlier slides. We proved that those were inverses. We also proved that these were inverses. And 
we just did that one. When you look at them graphically, remember that the X and Y are actually changing places. For invertibility, we can, just, um, we can restrict the domains. All that means is if a picture, a graph, does not pass the horizontal line test. So we said earlier that y equals x squared does not pass the horizontal line test. There it is. And we said, hey, look, this is not going to work for us. Unhappy. OK? Well, guess what? In calc, y equals x squared is our favorite function ever. So what we want to do is we want to say, you know what? I only want to look at half of it. So I'm going to say y equals x squared, but only where x is greater than or equal to 0, only because I like positive numbers better. I could also do the other side, and I could say, hey, let's restrict it and look at the negative side. I just prefer the positive. Okay? That's also going to be true for graphs that aren't functions. So we have this graph, which would say our vertical line test, so it's not a function, but we only want to look at one piece. So when we look at just the one piece here, then we're only going to look at the one piece here. If this is the piece we're looking at, then we're going to look at this is the inverse. Okay? So you want to make sure that in order to find an inverse of something that really itself is not one-to-one, -one, you can restrict the domain and therefore you can find the inverse of the function. Okay? All right. Oh, favorite trig functions. Um, those are our parent functions. Um, and remember, in order to have an inverse, you have to pass the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. Most importantly, the horizontal line test. So if we use the whole function here, you can see that our periodic functions, sine, cosine, and tangent, uh, cos uh, secant, would fail. So what we want to do is restrict those domains. So according to the previous slide, we just want to cut it off. So parent function for inverses are here. And by doing that, restricting the domains of the parent functions, we can find the inverse functions, but these are also only going to be valid over a certain interval. So now we're going to be valid from negative 1 to 1, negative 1 to 1. Notice this one is going to be valid everywhere. And notice here we have a gap, OK? So less than negative 1, greater than 1. All right, some de general definitions. These are going to refer back to the previous position graphs that you just saw, OK? So that's all we're going to do. Um, for all intents and purposes, the ones that we're really going to focus on, those tend to be the most important ones. Um, we'll sometimes see this, but um, inverse sine and inverse cosine tend to be used more frequently. Um, in fact, if I had to tell, I had to guess, I'd actually say this is more important than the inverse cosine. It's just used more frequently later in calculus. Again, notation, um, if we restrict sine to be from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, the output values there would be negative 1 and 1. And so those are also going to be the restrictions for the um, range and domain of the inverse function. OK, and that's just stating it. And again, I just said this, if we restrict the domain of the original function, that would have given us an output of negative 1 to 1. And I should include my brackets. Um, and so this is just telling you, hey, that's now the domain of your inverse. OK? So what was the input becomes the output. All right, find the exact values. So um, confirm it with a graphing calculator. Go ahead and pause now. Take a look at that. All right, from honors pre-calc, we should remember that this is a length from our baby unit circle. Um, you might better remember it as root 2 over 2, which is very nice because that's going to be at 45 degrees. But what this is really saying is this. And so what I want to look for 
is where is the sine of theta equal to root 2 over 2. And the first time that happens is quadrant 1, and that would be at pi over 4. That's where that happens. For part B, I'm looking for that. Where is the sine of theta equal to negative 1? Sine of theta is equal to negative 1 at negative pi over 2. You can actually check that now with a graphing calculator or a scientific calculator would work. All right, now we're going to do the quick check. Um, in each part here, on number four, please, please, please refer to your baby unit circle. We love her. I know you all have her. Um, and again, when you are finished with this on your own, you should be able to check your answers on page 52 so we can discuss that tomorrow in class before the practice.